Good evening and welcome to the fifth in a series of webinars that have been developed by the Young Innovators Fellows and Residents Committee of the uh, Aspen organization. These educational webinars are sponsored by Aspen and are given by current pain fellows. They're intended to supplement a current fellowship training and they're intended for people in training as well as those uh, physician individuals who are in that early five years of their uh, practice, as well as APPs who are uh, practicing pain medicine. My name is Tim Lubinow. I'm a uh, director, program director for the Pain Medicine Fellowship Training Program at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago. Tonight, our topic is understanding MRI interpretation of the lumbar spine and how it relates to decision-making in the treatment of degenerative disc disease. Joining me as co-moderator uh, co is my friend and colleague, Dr. Ramo Naidu. Dr. Naidu is an interventional pain specialist who practices in uh, Marin County, California. Ramo, welcome. Um, uh, please introduce yourself to the audience and introduce our speakers. Thanks so much, Tim, and thank you to Aspen and to Tim specifically for inviting me to be a part of this. As Tim just mentioned, my name is Ramo Naidu. I'm an anesthesiologist pain physician in Marin County, which is just north of San Francisco. Uh, I currently work in an orthopedic practice, multi-specialty group, uh, and of course, uh, have focused on interventional pain for the last several years. I am very excited about this webinar because I'll tell you guys, especially the fellows who are on, uh, 11, 12 years ago when I was a fellow, uh, the anterior column of the spine was relatively ignored. At that time, provocative discography was fading out uh, because of some reimbursement issues in California. And we didn't have any you know, real intradiscal therapies and we might've done a, a functional anesthetic discogram when, once in a while, but it was very few and far between. So my experience as a fellow with anterior column issues was very minimal. Enter today, I, you know, I'm, I'm seeing this, this rebirth and renaissance in the last few years of the anterior column and, and really our future is bright. So those of you who are watching today, this is super important because this is an, a part of the spine that actually many surgeons won't even address and they'll say that. Um, and you'll have the tools uh, based on the evidence you're gonna hear tonight uh, to help your patients out. So I'm excited about our crew. They're, they're spanning the country. Our first presenter will be Kushbu Baldev from Rutgers University. Uh, our second speaker will be uh, Chris Massey from Rush University. And our last but certainly not least is uh, Dr. Joseph Liao from Stanford University. And what we're gonna talk about in order, as you see, are the basics of MRI. Then we'll talk about intradiscal therapies with Chris. And then we'll get into basal vertebral nerve radiofrequency ablation. And then we'll open it up for any questions. So feel free to ask any questions uh, during the presentations and we'll get to them at the end. Kushbu to you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Naidu and Dr. Lubanow. Thanks everyone for joining us today evening. I am Kushbu Baldev and I am currently a pain fellow at Rutgers Robert Johnson University Hospital in New Jersey. Today I'll be going over the basics of MRI <clears throat> to facilitate um, understanding for regenerative versus ablative therapies for uh, degenerative disc disease. So today we'll be going over how an MRI is done, the neuroanatomy of the spine, how one should systematically uh, read and interpret an MRI uh, to include the pertinent treatment of the patient um, in terms of management, and specifically going over the degenerative disc disease staging uh, and modic changes as it pertains to basal vertebral nerve ablation, and disc bulging, protrusion, and extrusion as it pertains to contraindications with the ViaDisc procedure. So in order to capture an image, uh, the MRI system uses both magnetic and radio frequency waves into a patient's body. This energy is emitted by the atoms in the magnetic field, which sends a signal to the computer. The computer then uses a sophisticated model to convert the signals into an image. In essence, it is the movement of these hydrogen ions in the magnetic field that creates the basis of this image. Traditionally, the images are taken at every four millimeter cuts, but if you ask your radiology techs, they can adjust the dial cuts to get as thin as one millimeters at certain levels. 
This is most useful in identifying a small CSF leak and helping in assessing where this leak is exactly coming from. So when the body is placed in a strong magnetic field, such as an MRI scanner, the proton axes all line up in a similar alignment. This uniform alignment creates a magnetic vector oriented along the axis of the MRI scanner. When additional energy in the form of a radio wave is added to the magnetic field, the vector is deflected. When the radio frequency source is switched off, the magnetic vector returns to its resting state and this causes a signal to be emitted. It is this signal which is then used to create the MRI images. So the MRI is great for uh, diagnosing uh, certain disc pathologies, nerve compression, soft tissue injuries, ligamentum, ligament, such as ligamentous injuries, spinal cord injuries and cord parenchymal lesions, blood in the epidural spaces, and also identifying the chronicity of these pathologies. And of course, if there's an implant that is not MRI compatible, that's a contraindication. So one should understand that there is a high prevalence of abnormal findings among individuals without low back pain. MRI is, very sen is a very sensitive tool, but not a very specific tool for identifying a pain generator. In 2015, Brinjik cre um, created, um, he did a systematic review involving over 3,000 asymptomatic patients. And it was found that 37% of these patients, uh, 20 year olds, had disc degeneration. And almost all, 96% of 80 year olds, had disc degeneration with no low back pain. Similarly, 30% of these 20-year-olds and 84% of these 80-year-olds had a disc bulge. So once again, the MRI is very sensitive, but not a specific indicator of the pain generator. So you really have to put the history, the physical exam findings uh, to come up with a diagnosis and treat accordingly. So just wanted to go over a few basics. There are two types of images that we as pain physicians most commonly look at the T1 and the T2 weighted image. We know that the CSF in the T1 is dark and in the T2 it is white. The epidural fat is bright or white in both T1 and T2. And the inflammation or the swelling or edema is dark in T1 and bright in T2. So if you look at the two spine images on the right side, we know that the left-sided image is a T2 weighted image because the intervertebral discs have the nucleus pulposus or the white content in the center. And in the right image, it is dark. So we know that's a T1 weighted image. This is a side-by-side -side comparison of a pair of sagittal image of T2 on the left side and T1 on the right side. In each of these lumbar discs, there is an oval, on the left side, there's an oval white, um, which is the nucleus pulposus and the water contained in it. Uh, surrounding it is the black, which is the annulus. And you see that the CSF in the left image is white and the spinal cord is gray. So we know that's a T2 image. And on the right side, in contrast, uh, both the discs, the cord is dark. So we know that's T1. This is an axial view of the side-by-side -side of the same sagittal spine from the previous slide. And here I'd like you to focus on the central canal, which is immediately behind the vertebral body. You see the triangular white appearance and the circular dural sac within it, uh, as well as the epidural fat that is not only extending within the canal, but also extending outside of the neural foramen. So if you look at the same image on the right side, you see that the central canal there is um, dark and you know that that's, uh, it's surrounded by white, which is the epidural fat, so you know that's T1. And then the white streaks are, of course, in the posterior musculature, which is, again, just the, epi just the fat in the muscle. Here we see uh, an example of a degenerative disc disease. On the left is a sagittal T2 image, and on the right is an axial image. The yellow line on the axial image is, the, is in the middle of the canal, which correlates to that specific view of the sagittal image on the left side, which in this case is the clearest view of the spinal cord and the fluid in the midline. So here I'd like to point out in the sagittal image the cube shape of the L1 vertebral body. And in contrast, you can see as you 
move down that the nucleus pulposus has uh, lost its water content or progressively losing it and there's loss of diskite at L4, L5 and at the L5, L S1 levels as well. And on the right side, in the axial image, you're seeing that there is lateral recess stenosis with some crowding of the spinal nerves in the center, uh, which is, again, consistent with moderate uh, canal stenosis. Okay. So if you scroll cephalad or caudad on the sagittal image, you can then see the axial view of the spine at that specific vertebral body and at that disc level as you move from L5 to L4 or L3. And as you scroll to the level of interest or the possible pathology correlating with the patient's symptoms, you can then identify the nerve compression or that specific nerve root, and this helps uh, narrow down the possible generator of the pain and in terms of planning interventions for the patient and epidurals at that specific level that correlates with the patient's history and physical exam findings. So after you evaluate that, you can then move uh, the yellow line off center and use it to place it right alongside the neural foramen. And if you do so, you get this specific view or the image over here, which is the parasagittal view. And in this image, we're able to see uh, the in the parasagittal view, the L1, L2, L3 nerve roots surrounded by the fat. But in contrast, we're seeing the L4 nerve root, which is a little crowded and uh, stenosed. So, uh, for example, uh, this for a person interested in placing a DRG electrode, you look at this specific view to ask certain whether or not you can slip a one millimeter DRG electrode over that specific neural foramen. And again, we're seeing uh, some modic changes and. Um, so this, along with the next three slides, is the normal anatomy of the spine on the MRI that all fellows should recognize by now. Uh, it's important to understand the normal anatomy in order to identify the abnormal findings. So on the left side here, we see the thorax followed by the spinal canal, and on the right side is the posterior elements. We see some level of kyphosis over here. Um, so going systematically, uh, we know this as a T2-weighted image because of the white in the intervertebral discs. We see that the spinal cord is gray, followed by the CSF fluid, the epidural fat, and then the posterior elements. So this is just uh, really straightforward, normal findings. This is an axial uh, view of the spine, and here we see uh, that here we see the posterior, uh, the central spinal canal posterior to the vertebral body. And I did want to point out that as there is degeneration of the disc, we see facet hypertrophy as well as ligamentum hypertrophy, as well as narrowing of the nerve root that then comes out at that specific level. In contrast, the image on the left side, we don't see any nerve compression at all, um, you know, correlating to a healthy spine on the left image. And this is just a really great picture of all the elements that we look at in an axial view. And most of our therapies are indicated in the posterior segments, but we will also talk about, um, you know, pain with anterior flexion with, um, that Dr. Lau will go over with the nerve ablation. Again, another picture of a uh, relatively normal anatomy with the exception at the L5-S1 uh, disc. We're seeing that there is loss of uh, the water content in the nucleus pulposus, also seeing some modic changes at the end plate of L5 and S1. Similarly, on the right image, we're seeing L5-S1 loss of disc height. So again, a few essentials that one should understand with MRIs, they're very sensitive, but not a specific modality for, uh, for, under, for knowing the pain generators for lumbar spinal conditions. And this is where you really have to take the history and the physical and complement it with the MRI findings that you're looking at. So for example, the sensitivity uh, to determine the disc herniation is about 90 to 100%, but the specificity is much lower, 50%. So not every MRI finding deserves to be treated as a pain generator, and it's really important to correlate the history and the physical and treat the patient and not just the MRI findings.
So with that, we're going to discuss some of the spine pathologies and dive into the Furman grading scale. So here I wanted to point out that the Furman, the original Furman grading scale that was uh, that came out in 2001 had five uh, stages, one through five. Uh, but over time, it was modified in 2007, and uh, it had it goes up to grade eight. <clears throat> and Dr. Macy will talk more about that. But here I wanted to point out. Uh, that we're seeing early stage of degeneration, which is from grade one to grade three, and you see progressive loss of that water content. And starting grade four, which is advanced stage of degeneration, is where you start having loss of disc, you know, of course you're having loss of disc height, but also modic changes. And most of these regenerative or <laughs> regenerative therapies are indicated starting grade three of the Furman grading scale. So in, you know, again, going over um, the different stages, we're seeing here that a patient, a healthy patient in their 30s uh, will have, you know, grade two, uh, and as aging occurs, so there's further degeneration of the disc. And uh, as degeneration worsens, it starts affecting the end plates, and the bone disc interface is now affected which causes pro-inflammatory material from the nucleus pulposus to diffuse into the adjacent marrow. This incites an inflammatory cascade that results in bone marrow changes causing neovascularization, edema, swelling at this end plate, which we then see as modic changes on the MRI. Here I wanted to go over the modic changes in further detail. So there's three types of modic changes. Great, uh, one, two, and three correlating with mild, moderate, and severe. Modic changes one occur when, as we discussed earlier, there is uh, inflammation at the bone disc interface that causes inflammatory cascade to uh, cause swelling and edema at that specific end plate. And when there is edema, the it, it's noticed as a hyper intense or white signal on the T2 weighted image and a hypo-intense signal on the T1-weighted image. As degeneration worsens, the edema is now um, infiltrated with fat, and as we know, fat looks both bright on both T1 and T2-weighted image, so modic changes too will look bright on both T1 and T2-weighted image. And as degeneration worsens, it, the fat is now um, uh, replaced with sclerosis or fibrotic tissue, and it appears hypo-intense on both T1 and T2-weighted image. What I wanted to point out over here is you have to contrast and really look at the T1 image to differentiate between modic types 1 and type 2 changes, because in type 2, there will be fat and it will appear bright or hyper-intense on T1, and it will appear hypo-intense for modic type 1 change. This is another great visual image for the modic changes. In A, you see that there's some inflammation. In D, you see that there is some fatty infiltration. And in G, it is now fibrotic sclerotic tissue. And the similar findings are then seen in the T1 and T2 weighted images below. What I wanted to point out over here is the clinical significance of these findings and uh, how it correlates with the inclusion criteria for basivertebral nerve ablation. We know that any patient with anterior column pain or pain that is worth with, worse with flexion, in addition to that, uh, with MRI findings correlating to modic type 1 and type 2 changes, is a great candidate for basivertebral nerve ablation. So this is our final segment going into uh, going over the pathologies of disc displacements and uh, how it correlates to via disc contraindications. I wanted to point out uh, some disc displacements, um, specifically diffuse versus focal. A diffuse uh, disc displacement is when you have circumferential enlargement of the disc relative to the vertebral body, and this is usually due to degeneration, as you can see, annular bulging where the vertebral body has compressed the disc and the annulus bulges outwards in all directions. The other classification is focal, and here uh, it really depends on whether the annulus is intact or not. 
So if the annulus is intact and there is uh, um, uh, the bowing of the nucleus into the annulus, that is protrusion. And if the annulus uh, has been disrupted, you now have extrusion of the, nu of the contents outside of the disc. So you can think of it as a jelly donut where the jelly is plopping out of the donut in extrusion and with sequestration the jelly has left the donut and lost continuity with the disc structure itself and the reason why this is important is uh, specifically to point out the contraindication to the via disc procedure uh, the when they performed the study for via disc they specifically excluded candidates uh, who had contained disc protrusions greater than five millimeters or disc extrusions or listhesis greater than five millimeters so this is an axial image of uh, the bulging disc and we know that this is a bulging disc because you see circumferential enlargement of the disc relative to the vertebral body in all directions here you see uh, protrusion uh, because we see that the annulus is intact and on the left side it is uh, extending uh, beyond and of course it's tough to tell how extensive this protrusion is so in order to really measure it we'd have to also see the sagittal image. This is an example of the extrusion of the disc, which is, if it's greater than five, a contraindication. But what I wanted to point out here is if you look at the sagittal image, the extrusion is contained at the level of the disc. But there are times where it is not contained at the level of the disc and there can be cephalad or caudad migration of that extrusion. So again, here, this is a great picture of the cephalad uh, and caudad uh, extrusion of the disc and it also helps in measuring uh, the extent of the extrusion and making sure that it is not fitting the exclusion criteria or the contraindication for the via disc procedure. So one should really uh, take into account and be very careful of these MRI findings before choosing the perfect candidate for these procedures. So we've reviewed the technical aspects of how to obtain an MRI image, the normal anatomy of the spine, as well as the pathology of the degenerative disc disease, uh, modic changes, as well as protrusions and extrusions. So with that, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Chris Macy, who is a pain fellow at Rush University Medical Center. Thank you, Kushbu. Um, hi, my name is Chris. I'm one of the fellows at Rush University currently. Today, I'm going to be talking about intradiscal therapeutics. Um, these are therapies that are used to treat discogenic back pain. Therapies that I'm going to be talking about specifically include the biodisc supplemental allograft, platelet-rich plasma, and mesenchymal stem cells. My goal today is to briefly describe all of these therapies and discuss the current data that's available for them. So as discussed previously, discogenic back pain occurs when the discs become dehydrated and lose water content. This results in an increase in the compressive forces applied to the vertebral bodies. Due to this, patients will experience an increase in pain with flexion and a decrease in pain with extension because of the load that comes off of the disc with extension. These patients may or may not have radicular symptoms, um, and the degree of degeneration can be objectively measured using MRI with the Furman grading scale as described before. Patients who are appropriate candidates for intradiscal therapy um, have discogenic back pain like this, and they've had it for greater than six months in a failed conservative management, such as medications, physical therapy, and injections. Um, this is a um, photograph of the modified Furman grading scale. It's an expansion of the original Furman grading scale. It's currently the most widely used classification for intravertebral disc degeneration. And so what we're going to be focusing on, these treatments are all um, um, targeted for Furman's grade three through seven. And the reason they're targeted for grade three through seven is because grades one and two are usually not bad enough to necessitate intradiscal therapy. And grade eight is um, too far gone to have any benefit. So the first therapy I'm going to discuss is intradiscal supplemental allograft. At this time, there are not many supplements on the market. Biodisc is the most well-known. 
The aim of ViaDisc is to restore the height of the, ge the generated disc, thereby decreasing pain from compressive forces. The allograft is derived from a proprietary mix of processed human nucleus pulposus tissue and spine-derived cells. It comes in a specialized container, container that can be reconstituted in saline prior delivery and is delivered through a 20-gauge needle into the nucleus pulposus. The matrix also contains glycosaminoglycan, which creates a hydrostatic pressure in the disc, which allows it to draw in water to increase water content and restore height. Here we have a picture of a discogram obtained during a via disc injection. Um, you can see the 20 gauge needle going to the center of the L5S1 disc space at the approximate location of the nucleus pulposus. It's not necessary always to do a discogram prior to via disc, but it can be helpful in aiding diagnosis. So this, the data that we have with via disc comes from the VAST trial. This is a prospective parallel arm multi-centered RCT that followed 218 patients over 12 months. These patients were randomized to receive either via disc, an injection of saline, or non-surgical management. The non-surgical management group was allowed to cross over into the via disc group at three months if their pain was not adequately controlled at that time. The, their VAST scores and ODI measurements were taken at three, six, and 12 months. Their, those were their primary outcomes. Their secondary outcomes included SF36, X-ray and MRI measurements, adverse events, and serious adverse events. The first 24 patients in this study were evaluated at one month to assess for safety of the procedure. In this group, no serious event, adverse events were reported, and so the study was carried forward, and their data was published in an earlier article. So like I said, there were 218 patients in the study, 141 of them received the active allograft, 38 received saline, and 39 um, were randomized to non-surgical management. All of the patients in the non-surgical management worsened after three months and thus crossed over into the allograft group. After about a year, the mean VAS score improvement was 54% at one year, and the mean ODI score improvement was 53%. This constituted a statistically significant difference in their pain level at baseline. However, when it was compared to the placebo, this decrease in pain and ODI score was not statistically significant. However, on further subgroup analysis, patients that reported a greater than 10 or a greater than 15 point improvement in their ODI scores, as well as patients who reported a greater than 20 point decrease in their VAS scores had a statistically significant reduction compared to placebo. In the secondary outcomes, 66 total adverse events occurred. 23 of these were considered possibly related to the procedure. And the most common adverse effect was a temporary increase in their pain. There were 11 adverse events that were reported in the allograph group that um, six of those were considered to be part of as a potential consequence of the via disc injection. Three of those instances were infection, two um, cases of osteomyelitis, and three of those cases were a prolonged increase in pain, especially back pain. With this, the authors concluded that via disc is a may be a very good option for patients who have failed conservative management for their discogenic back pain, and the safety profile of VioDisc was similar to routine discography. This is a comparative MRI from a random subject in the 12 month follow up of the first 24 patients. Um, in the MRI, you can see that there is some restoration of the disc height, there is decreased extrusion of the L45 disc, and as well as increased patency of the spinal canal. In this particular patient, he had a tremendous vast decrease from 72 to 9, and his ODI, I'm sorry, their ODI decreased from 48 to 17%. So the next therapy I'm going to talk about is intradiscal PRP. As many of you know, PRP is a substance derived from plasma that contains platelets about two to five times the concentration of normal peripheral blood. According to the American Red Cross, PRP is defined as a, having a concentration of greater than 5.5 times 10 to the 10th power platelets per 50 milliliters. PRP is harvested when whole blood is taken from a patient and centrifuged to separate the contents into platelet-poor plasma, PRP, and red blood cells. 
in general, a 30 cc venous draw of blood will yield about three to five cc's of PRP, depending on which apparatus is used. Um, PRP is an interesting source of treatment modality in many other in many specialties, including dermatology, orthopedics, cardiac surgery. And this is because of the growth factors that platelets have. Um, platelets are known to have, be natural sources of signaling molecules, growth factors, and cytokines that can affect inflammation, angiogenesis, stem cell migration, and cell proliferation. This is thought to be a mechanism of tissue healing. The most important growth factors released by platelets in PRP include vascular endothelial growth factor, fibroblast growth factor, platelet-derived growth factor, epidermal growth factor, and then many others. So this is a randomized double-blind control study of patients who were randomized to receive either PRP intradiscally or contrast as a placebo. Um, the study used a very rigorous inclusion-exclusion criteria in order to maintain homogeneity between the patients and to prevent confounding variables. 50 patients were randomized into, um, to either receive um, PRP or contrast. 28 of those patients followed up at six months, 21 followed up after a year. Again, the patients received a statistically significant improvement in their pain and function scores, but when compared to placebo, there wasn't a statistical significance in improvement. There was also no statistical significant improvement in their functional capacity or SF36 functional, physical function scores. Because of this, the PRP and the control group outcomes were not compared after eight weeks. However, the PRP group was followed for a year and continued to see statistically significant decreases in pain and improvements in function at 12 months. To continue with that study, the authors followed the same people from the previous study into a five to nine year follow-up. Um, those 21 participants who were able to follow up after one year were surveyed to see how they were doing after a, a time period of about five to nine years. 19 of those completed the survey. The survey included NRS pain score, SF36 score, SF36 physical function, and functional rating index scores. The respondents reported continued statistically significant improvements in their pain and function in all categories. 58% of patients expressed satisfaction with the PRP, um, and 15%, sorry, 71% reported clinically and significant improvements that and were classified as successes. Six or 29% of those patients underwent subsequent surgery and were therefore classified as failures. However, of those six patients who did receive surgery, two of them believed that the PRP injection prolonged their need for surgery. Next, I'm gonna briefly touch on intradiscal mesenchymal stem cells. Next slide. These are multipotent stem cells that are found in bone marrow and uh, are important for making and repairing skeletal tissues such as cartilage, bone, and marrow fat. This is a study, recent study in pain physician that followed 33 patients over 24 months. The patients were treated with mesenchymal stem cells derived from Wharton's jelly, which is found in umbilical cords. After two years, these patients all had statistically significant improvements in their VAS scores, their ODI scores, as well as statistically significant improvement in their Furman grading scales. No patients reported any adverse events to treatment, and the authors concluded that this was a safe option for patients with discogenic back pain. So to round all of that out, um, I have included here a, a meta-analysis from the Spine Journal. This is a large meta-analysis reviewing the effectiveness of intradiscal biologics. The main takeaway of this is out of 3,063 studies and papers that they were able to find on the subject, only 12 were redeemed adequate enough to meet their inclusion criteria. Their inclusion criteria required that they um, show original data and use appropriate study methodology that can be replicated um, so very rigorous. The evidence available showed good improvement with PRP and MSC, but they were very small and lacked generalizability. Overall, the authors concluded that the current published evidence of intradiscal MSC and PRP is of very low quality, 
and they stress the need for high quality explanatory trials to better assess the true efficacy. So in conclusion, current evidence of these biological treatments are weak and low quality. Current studies are small and underpowered. There are other intradiscal therapies such as synthetic intradiscal therapies that are still being conducted and more high quality studies are needed in order to determine the efficacy of these biologics. Here we have the Aspen recommendations um, and level of evidence. As you can see, this is a level 1B evidence for PRP and MSC because there are randomized control trials, but the authors gave it a grade of I for insufficient evidence to be able to make a claim of whether it is it is good or not. And with that, that's the end of my slide, and I will pass it on to Dr. Lau for the next portion of the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. So my name is Joseph Liao. I'm the Chief Bell at Stanford, and I'm extremely excited for the opportunity to present a procedure we do in our department that has helped many patients, which is basal vertebral nerve ablation. So let's talk about the overview. We are first going to talk about the anatomy of the basal vertebral nerve. We are also going to talk about how to diagnose anterior column pain. We'll talk about the procedure, some level one real world data, as well as patient selection for this procedure. The basal vertebral nerve's function is to transmit nociceptive pain from the vertebral end plates. It originates from the sinew vertebral nerves. And if you were to recall from basic anatomy, that is derived from the ventral rami. The basal vertebral nerves travel through the basal vertebral foramen, also known as the central vascular foramen. And it courses anteriorly until the third of the diameter of the vertebral body relative to the posterior border. And then it subsequently arborizes towards the superior and inferior end plates. So when you look at the images on the right, they're really there to highlight that the nerves travel at that level into the vertebral body until about 30 to 50% of the way before arborizing towards the superior as well as the inferior end plates. You can also see that on MRI as well. How do we diagnose anterior column pain? The classic clinical presentation is low back pain that's specifically worse with lumbar flexion, prolonged sitting, changing position from sitting to standing, and holding heavy objects. And one of my favorite questions to ask my patients is, when you're holding two bags of grocery, one on each arm, do you feel like the pain makes it worse? And I'll talk about why that makes sense. The, na the natural symptomatology of anterior column pain is typically deep burning and or aching sensation. The severity of symptoms can be highly variable, although flare-ups can last up to days at a time. So when we look at the images in the bottom right here, the first image is neutral loading position. Our lumbar spine is typically lordotic. And so when we're loading the lumbar spine, typically the weight is distributed between the anterior column as well as the posterior elements, uh, specifically the facets. When we do flexion loading as a provocative motion, all the weight is actually distributed along the disc as well as the vertebral body. And so that's why it's very important to ask these questions to the patients to ensure that we're targeting the anterior column. And Dr. Baldev did a fantastic job of explaining this but if we were to try to diagnose vertebrogenic anterior column pain via imaging, we want to ensure that we see modic types one and two changes. Because in type one, as you recall, has inflammation edema and type two has fatty infiltration. Both of them have active inflammatory processes that can increase the nociceptive pain. And there's other types of imaging modalities that have demonstrated that, such as the one in item C on the side. So let's talk about the procedure. And this is actually one of my favorite procedures to perform. Uh, basal vertebral nerve ablation is typically performed under general anesthesia or monitored anesthetic care. Preoperatively, you should give antibiotics. The typical agents we give are cefazolin, two grams to three grams, depending on their weight, or clindamycin, 600 to 900 milligrams, if they can't tolerate cephalosporins. The probe itself is a bipolar probe and we burn the basal vertebral nerves at 85 degrees centigrade for about seven to 15 minutes. Now, what we've learned is that with targeted lesioning, and if you're confident about where your probe tip is, you can actually burn the nerves for about seven minutes and have excellent results. And for this procedure, it's FDA approved for the L3 to S1 vertebral body levels. The L1 and L2 levels can be targeted, and we do perform it within our division, 
you just have to be mindful of where the conus medullaris terminates for your patient. And for this procedure, patient expectation is very important. It can take weeks to months before taking into effects. So let's talk about the procedural targets. The upper half of the slide are for the lumbar targets, and the lower half of the slide is for the sacral, specifically the S1 target. So for the lumbar targets, you want to ensure that you're in the 30 to 50% mark anterior to the posterior wall, as well as 50% inferior to the superior end plate, because this is typically where the basal vertebral nerve lives. Additionally, you want to keep a 10 millimeter safety distance anterior to the posterior wall to ensure that you don't target any unintended areas. Now, what I want to highlight in the image on the right with this axial view is that there you can see where the nerve traverses. And again, you want to make sure you leave 10 millimeters of distance. Although I will say that with the procedure, it is still very safe, even if you're a little bit off. And the reason why I say that is because the protective layers around the spinal cord, as well as the other structures nearby can act as an insulating barrier. Now, if you look at the bottom half of the screen uh, for the sacral target, you want to be 50% anterior to the posterior wall in the lateral image and about 40% inferior to the superior end plate. I also want to highlight how this procedure is performed in the sense that it is classically performed in a transpedicular approach. Now, the other procedure that we commonly perform in our pain space that utilizes the transpedicular approach is kyphoplasty and vertebroplasty. I want to emphasize that the difference between the two is that for the kyphoplasty, you're typically trying to target the anterior third of the vertebral body so that you can slowly inject cement, withdraw a little bit, target the middle third, withdraw again, then target the posterior third. With basal vertebral nerve ablation, you actually want to dock more laterally and have more of a lateral to medial trajectory through the pedicle. So your final target is actually in the posterior third to middle third. So that's really important because you really want to be as spot on as possible. The bottom image is one of my favorite images that I actually learned from Dr. Naidu many months ago at a different course. And this is an image looking at the bone density if one were to use a transpedicular approach. And so no matter what type of procedure you're performing, if it uses, utilizes transpedicular approach, you should really pay attention and truly understand where you have the highest amount of bone density so that you decrease the risk of complications like fractures and nerve injury. This is the image of the RFA probe electrode uh, being deployed. Uh, what I want to highlight here is you want to make sure that the tip is actually past the midline because the actual active section of the electrode is just proximal to the tip. And again, in the AP view, you want to be past midline. And in the lateral view, you want to be about 30 to 50% anterior to the posterior wall for the lumbar levels and about 50% anterior to the posterior wall for the sacral level. Let's talk about some of the evidence behind this procedure. One of the studies is the SMART trial. And this is a double-blinded, sham-controlled, multi-center RCT with five years of follow-up and involves 13 different centers. There were 225 subjects involved. 147 were randomized to the treatment arm, meaning they received basal vertebral nerve ablation, and the other 78 had no treatment with BVN specifically. Every patient had greater than six months of isolated low back pain, refractory to six months of conservative management, and they all had modic type one and two changes. Now, the key measurement outcomes that they looked at were ODI, which is a disability index, which also talks about the functionality as well as a vast pain index that we're all very familiar with. And there was actually a high crossover rate with this study because patients were doing very well in the treatment arm. So these are the primary outcomes they're looking at. Let's focus on the left side of the screen and talk about the functionality through the ODI score. What was very impressive was that at the five-year mark, there was a 61% mean functional improvement. So when you look at the numbers there, 42.81 and 16.86, the decrease in ODI number means that they're less disabled, meaning they're more functional. Now, when you turn your attention to the right side of the screen, where we look at the VAS, which is also an indicator of the pain score, two-thirds of patients had greater than 50% durable relief at the five-year mark. And you can really attribute this to the basal vertebral nerve ablation, because when you look at the bottom images, where they tracked each of these metrics over a five-year span with 
intermittent intervals in between, everything's tied to that three-month follow-up. And when you look at where the three-month follow-up starts and where it ends at the five-year mark, you really see continued pain relief and continual improvement in functionality. The next trial I want to talk about is Intracept. The Intracept trial is a prospective, paralleled, open-labeled, multi-center RCT involving 20 American sites. There were 140 subjects involved. Uh, there were randomized one-to-one. -one. The treatment arm received basal vertebral nerve ablation, and the control arm had standard care. All, again, all the patients had greater than six months of low back pain, as well as type 1 or 2 modic changes between L3 and S1. The outcomes they measured were similar. They also measured ODI as well as a vast pain score. They also looked at some secondary outcomes uh, to assess for quality of life through the SF36 as well as the EQ study. There was clear statistical superiority for all primary as well as secondary patient reported outcome measures in the BVN arm compared to the standard arm. Now at the three month mark, the functional aspect of patients actually increased because there was a decrease of 21 points in the treatment arm compared to 15 points in the conservative therapy, meaning patients were less disabled and more functional. 76% of patients in the treatment arm improved symptomatically versus 55% in standard treatment at three months, meaning they had less pain. And what was most remarkable about the study is that the Data and Safety Monitoring Board, which is the governing board for assessing ethics as well as how medical research is conducted, the Data and Safety Medical Monitoring Board actually halted the study to allow for BVN because it was considered to be unethical to continue with the conservative care arm. And this is really the only technology that we have in the spine space that has this portfolio of evidence. So in summary, how do you find the ideal candidate for this procedure? Well, number one, symptomatically, they have to have anterior column pain. That means they have to have pain that's exacerbated by flexion, prolonged sitting, and holding heavy objects. They also should be refractory to six months of conservative therapy, and they should also have motive types one or two changes on imaging that should be documented by the radiologist. And again, this procedure is FDA approved for L3 to S1, although L1 and L2 are permissible. You just have to be very mindful of the spinal cord. The other topics that I wanted to touch upon are that discogenic and vertebrogenic anterior column pain can both be present at the same time, and it can be challenging to delineate. And the severity of each condition in isolation is on a spectrum. So you really want to differentiate based off of chronicity as well as imaging findings. And of course, we want to treat the patient and not the imaging. And with that, we'll move on to the Q&A section. Thank you, everybody. I um, want to congratulate all the presenters on a uh, job well done. We have a few moments here for uh, questions. And as the questions come in from the uh, audience, let me throw one particular question to uh, Dr. Baldell first. When you want to um, make a determination of a Furman grading scale in a particular MRI, is there a certain image that one looks to, or does it make a difference whether or not you look at axial or sagittal images? That's a great question. So in order, the best image to look at for degenerative spine is the sagittal T2 weighted image because we're specifically interested in the water content of the nucleus pulposus, which is white on the T2 weighted image. So um, again, we're not, you know, looking at T1 or the axial T1. We're specifically interested in the T2 sagittal image. And Ramo, do you have any questions for our speakers? Yeah, I I thought you guys did a tremendous job and that was a great review of MRI. And for all the fellows that are on tonight and, and for some people that are in the first few years, there's been a huge change in our field with having to understand radiology. And we didn't do a radiology residency or anything like that, but your future is really dependent on it with these new technologies. So I think have, hosting this course was really important and I hope you gathered a lot. My question for, I'll ask the entire group because you guys did a great job going through different anterior column procedures. So let's say we have a 47 year old gentleman who a year ago uh, developed radicular pain, axial pain as well. The radicular pain went away after about a month, but he continued to have episodes of axial low back pain. And you're just seeing him a year later. He presents to you with axial low back pain, lumbosacral band pattern, worse with flexion, 
doesn't like tying his shoes, doesn't like driving, no ridiculous symptoms at this point. You have an MRI and it shows disgeneration at L5S1 modified Fearman grade four, and you also see anterior motive one changes. Uh, no significant stenosis, no significant facet arthropathy on the MRI. I'll start with you, Kushbu. What would you do in that situation? So in this patient who has specifically anterior column pain with modic changes, I would opt for the intercept procedure, the basivertebral nerve ablation, and keeping in mind that uh, it would resolve or it would help with the vertebrogenic pain or the anterior column pain, but the pain that uh, you know is still there with perhaps extension or discogenic pain might still be there and the patient might still need other therapies after the basic vertebral nerve ablation. Great. And Chris? So yeah, I was the one who I would I would also agree with uh Kushbu and go with basic vertebral ablation on this one. Because I do think that I do think that the evidence is a little bit better. And Dr. Liao? I think it depends on the patient uh, specifically about what they're what, what they're comfortable with. So with the VIDIS, it's performed under sedation, uh, typically light to moderate sedation, if any. And with the basal vertebral nerve ablation, it requires moderate to deep sedation, often general anesthesia. So if a patient is averse to getting more anesthetics on board, I'd be more inclined to try uh, disco supplementation to start. However, if they're not averse to it, I agree with the rest of the panel. I would probably start with basal vertebral nerve ablation as well. Excellent answers. You're all correct. Uh, what you have to think about is the evidence basis, uh, the, the uh, coverage that you're going to deal with in the next few years, the insurance policies, the reimbursement that, that plays a role in what you what you can do for your patients. And then, of course, as Joseph just said, what the patient is interested in once you talk about the anesthesia, the recovery or whatever else and what to expect. So all of those factors play a role. And any one of the therapies we discussed tonight could be a possibility in the situation. So great job. Tim, back to you. So one of the questions that have come in from the audience here is, uh, and I'll address this to Chris, are prophylactic antibiotics necessary for the intradiscal injection of uh, PRP? No, I would say no. Um, as long as you, the key components to worry about is that the disc is avascular largely. And so, there is a worry there for infection, discitis, osteomyelitis, but as long as you keep strict sterile technique, there shouldn't be a need for pre-op antibiotics. So there's another study, I, mean, I should say another question that's put forth by a different uh, audience member, and it uh, indicates that the Viadisc study had two patients out of 141 patients with osteomyelitis and one out of the 141 had bacteremia. And so how would you justify these risks to patients uh, given these findings from the VIA-DISC study? Anybody want to uh, chime in there? Well, with anything, you need to weigh the risks and the benefits of any procedure that we do. And so it all starts with having a serious conversation with the patient, um, telling them this is what the potential risk is, um, telling them that you're going to do everything you can to prevent it, but even in the best circumstances, it is still a possibility, and just make sure that they understand that and then come to a shared decision at that point. I think, yeah, I mean, uh, and also to answer the um, questioner's uh, viewpoint, it really depends upon some of the patient factors. We don't have any uh, understanding of what the different patient factors are. There's certainly patients who are at greater risk for infection. Let's say they're taking certain medications that alter their immune status, or perhaps they have uh, um, diabetes. So certainly that may sh um, push one um, treating individual in a different direction as to whether or not to offer them versus the other. Um, the other thing to understand is uh, these uh, infections, although substantial, are generally treatable, but they do require usually six weeks of IV antibiotics. And I guess like the only other thing is that um, when offering the VIADIS procedure, I'm also pretty transparent with the patients that, uh, you know, there is data that was done, but the um, 
sample size was small and just sort of because so that they have an idea that this is a new therapy and that there's more studies that are being done and also being transparent about you know the infection risk or the patients that did have infections so that they're also aware um, and not very hopeful like because it's very important to set expectations when doing these therapies for the patients and uh, here's one last question and perhaps Ramo, you might have the best experience to answer this the question comes from um, um, someone in practice how is payment with this procedure when done outside of the academic setting. Uh, you want to comment on that and uh, state some of the differences from state to state or different regions? Yeah, I'll do, I'll do my best. I obviously know Northern California very well, um, but I'll speak first about the intradiscal supplemental allograft, otherwise known as Viadisc. It currently has a T code, um, so category three, that's 0627T. So um, there are different coverage parameters um, for the different Medicare contractors. So depending on where you guys are, uh, you may be able to do it or you may not be able to do it for your patients. Um, there's reimbursement for the ASC and HOPD or hospital settings. And there of course also is a professional fee. Um, oftentimes with T codes, they may not, the payer being Medicare primarily won't pay for the professional fee. So you do need to ask your patients to sign an advanced beneficiary notice to make sure you get payment, which is something you'll probably learn about in the next few years. Um, most commercial payers don't cover T codes. So there may be some regional ones, don't get me wrong, but in general, it's a little bit harder. For the basal vertebral nerve radio frequency ablation, the CPT code is a category one. So that is 64628 for a single level, which is two burns, two, two vertebral bodies, and 64629 for the additional level. Um, Coverage is, is growing, Medicare does cover it, and other commercial payers are, are coming too, um, and, and reimbursement continues to improve as well. So that, that does matter. Um, and again, ASC, HOPD, and then intradiscal PRP and the mesenchymals, there's a T code for those. Uh, oftentimes people just uh, address that with cash payment because that's outside of the parameters of most commercial payers. And I'll share with you my experience in Illinois. If one talks about the intradiscal therapies, such as um, uh, Viadisc, um, the Medicare carrier for the state of Illinois doesn't consider this medically necessary. And so that's uh, problematic. But for example, if patients are injured in the work environment, um, the Illinois Workers' Compensation um, fee schedule does permit this to be uh, a reimbursable um procedure uh no illinois generally has felt to have a relatively um patient friendly uh workers compensation fee schedule uh, and so that's one thing uh, taking into consideration because it's not universally seen across the country uh, another question comes in when ordering an mri and suspecting degenerative disc disease to potentially be able to use via disc does one need to specifically ask a radiologist to comment on the exact degree of disc degeneration for insurance coverage for via disc and you could liberalize this for uh, msc as well as prp as well anybody want to take that particular question i'm happy to weigh in because <laughs> this is this is real world stuff so uh, traditionally with via disc uh, one of the things you can do in Chris's slide, he had all the modified Fearman and the green highlight. You can put that on your computer screens and then compare. Um, you have the right to uh, designate uh, the Fearman, modified Fearman grade. Um, and it's always good to justify it with the picture and the comparison to that scale to really prove to the payer that, you know, this is what it is. You can always get a radiologist support. For the basal vertebral nerve RFA, you, you do need a radiologist supplementing or at least describing degenerative end plate changes or motor changes. That is a requirement uh, for the payers or you may risk a uh, loss of reimbursement. So um, that summarizes those two procedures. And for PRP, you don't really need to justify anything. If you feel it's appropriate, you, you just go ahead and do it. Yeah, I think one of the um, real intents of this particular series of webinars <clears throat> addressing the importance of understanding MRI is to point out that we as interventional pain specialists really need to up our game in terms of our expertise and being able to describe and interpret MRIs 
with a similar level of um, uh, efficiency and uh, knowledge as our spine surgeons, for example. And so that is one of the purposes by which um, this particular series of webinars was started because in your uh, fellowship um, training period, one uh, may have looked at just 15 MRIs, let's say 10 and 15 years ago when these new guidelines went into um, uh, their first description by uh, ACGME in 2007. Now, in today's day and age, a fellow should look at a minimum of 100 MRIs and interpret 100 MRIs in their fellowship, if not more than that. And so you should have a fairly comfortable understanding of reading and interpreting MRIs. And I hope that this gives you some guidance to, to do so, because you're the one who's going to need to be able to detect which patient or um, discern which patient is going to need this procedure. You may go back and ask your radiologist to reinterpret an MRI if they didn't say that there was end plate changes. What I've heard some other practicing pain physicians do is that they'll actually network and meet with their radiologist. They'll be in a relationship where they send most of their patients to certain radiology centers for uh, MRIs and they'll meet with the radiologist and say, hey, even though historically you may not have always commented on the presence of end plate changes. Could you, from my series of patients, always stipulate, yes, these are end plate changes at L45 or whatever level they are, because this does grease the wheels uh, somewhat in terms of getting authorization for uh, these procedures from the office staff. Um, I just want to highlight what Tim said there. When you guys go out into practice, really know your radiologist, your community. Uh, I just, I texted them today. You know, I needed them to make a, an addendum. So really important you do that. They, they enjoy that as well. Yeah. And then uh, there is one last question here. What biologic therapy is best since they seem to be for the uh, same severity of degenerative disc disease? And that's really a, an open book at this point. Um, you know, one can't necessarily say that um, there's a dramatic difference between one versus the other versus another because this simply has not been studied. Um, Chris did a credible job just describing that we have a paucity of evidence across the space here as it relates to injection of biologics. So uh, we can't really say with any certainty that you should use this versus the other one as of yet. But if you want to make your name in um, uh, pain medicine in this next generation of pain physicians, this is an ample uh, space to do so. And so with that, I'd like to thank everyone for their uh, attention here. I want to thank each of our uh, presenters uh, for tonight's presentation and thank uh, Ramo for uh, participating and helping me prepare this with our um, speakers. Um, if we could see the next slide, there's a couple of events that are coming up that I want to draw everyone's attention to. Um, first of all, we have our Aspen annual meeting in uh, July in Miami. It's going to be a great event. We're still looking for people to submit abstracts for the meeting. As part of the meeting, there is a uh, Aspen charity event, a um, 5K run that everybody's uh, invited to participate in. And you can, um, you know, challenge some of your uh, colleagues and friends uh, or some of the other reps that you network with and to see if they're going to uh, participate in this. It's always uh, something that one looks forward. And finally, we do have on our last slide here, uh, the uh, advertisement for our fifth annual annual meeting of uh, Aspen. It will be at the Fountain Blue. This is going to be an exciting, uh, fabulous event. Uh, Aspen has rented out the entire Fountain Blue Hotel just for the meeting. If you haven't been to the Fountain Blue, it's a uh, fabulous uh, experience. And so uh, I would invite everybody to uh, sign up. You can see on the uh, website that you can sign up for uh, the meeting as well as hotel space um, right now. Uh, with that, I want to thank everybody for their uh, kind attention and everyone have a good night. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Great job.